I will uh, start uh, by just introducing briefly myself. My name is Dennis Shapira. I'm an independent fellow at the Harvard Medical School and the Broad Institute. I work with Professor Peter Sorger and Professor Avi Fregeff on the variety of highly multiplex imaging technologies, including t codex, Codex, uh, MIBI, and I did my PhD uh, in Zurich with Baron Bodenmiller working on imaging mass cytometry and developmental <coughs> analysis, including Histocat. What I would suggest is that everyone who is an active participant here should just briefly write their name into the chat and I will just put this um, as the people that should just introduce briefly themselves after each other there. I would just start with Sultan and then everyone else should just enter their name. Hi, my name is Zoltan Malaga. I'm a senior scientist at Harvard Medical School uh, working at the uh, the multiplex imaging platform where we use antibody-based methods to do multiplex imaging. Along with that, a lot of computational analysis. And we are part of H10 consortium, just important to mention. Okay. Ron Germain. Hi, I'm a very senior, very senior investigator at the NIH NIID. We do multiplex imaging, mostly in the immune system. We're part of the HCAC network for the thymus. And we also do work on computational methods for analyzing the data. Uh, Anoop is next. Yeah. So my name is Anoop Sood. I'm a GE research. I'm one of the developers of the CellDive platform which is essentially a highly multiplexed immunofluorescence platform. And we are part of the HubMap consortium. Sinem? Hi, I'm Sinem Saka. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in Harvard Medical School in Pongin's lab. We are working on developing DNA-based multiplexing techniques. Currently, we are working on immunosaber for multiplex insulin signal amplification. And we are part of the HubMap uh, consortium. Thank you. Uh, Qin Ma, next. Hi, everyone. This is Qin Ma. Actually, Q pronounced as a CH in Chinese. Yeah. I'm an associate professor from the Ohio State University. I'm personally trained in mathematics and currently is working on the computational modeling and analysis of single cell sequencing data. Yeah. Thank you. Peter Sorger. I'm uh, Peter Sorger, and I'm a professor at, um, at, at Harvard Medical School, and I work for Dennis um, on uh, highly multiplexed imaging. OK, anyone else uh, that would like to introduce themselves that is an active participant should just write their name into the chat, and then you, we can just do this in a more organized manner. I think for the people that joined later. Okay, Neil. Oh, hi. Yeah, Neil Kelleher, Northwestern. I'm part of HubMap, and we're doing a lot of uh, immunoprecipitation followed by top down mass spec for proteform analysis within antibody based imaging technologies. Uh, Emma Lundberg. Hi, I'm Emma Lundberg. I'm not in a HubMap project, but I'm a professor at KTH in Sweden and also co-director of the Human Protein Atlas project. And we're working a lot with computational image analysis at large scale and getting into the issues also with uh, computational image analysis of highly multiplexed imaging. Emma, can you introduce your research assistant there sitting to your left? Oh, yes. This is Edith. She's six years old and she's working on a very important problem at the moment. Hello, Edith. <laughs> ah, <laughs> she can't hear you because I have the headphones, but she says hi. <laughs> Thank you very much. So then I think if there's no one else um, that would like to introduce, I mean, we can just do this during the uh, during the meeting also. 
Um, I would start with the first uh, discussion prompt, but I'm also, I'm trying to be as quiet as possible and just moderate the, uh, the discussions. So one of the points that we would like to discuss is data standards and whether the different consortia have- Dennis, do you have a scribe selected? Yes, we do. Oh, you do, I'm sorry, I missed that. My apologies, excuse me. Sinem and Zoltan are our scribes. And I also uh, put the link to the Google Docs um, uh, in the chat so you can follow the scribes there. So yeah, I would just open it up for a data standards discussion um, and, and just see what the different consortia came up with. What are you currently using? Do you already have a, a standard that you have defined internally potentially in your center? So I will just open it up and you can just raise your hand and I can then just tell your name and you can go ahead. Dennis, when you talk about standards, there are two different things. One is how do you archive and, and keep data available for people to uh, reanalyze, to look at and so forth, which the open microscope platform, other things have, uh, the you know, European consortium has worked on for a long time. And then there are standards for actually anal analyzing those data. So I think we have to split in two directions. How do we catalog data to be, have it accessible? And how do you process it and make people aware of what you've done for processing? So I think we need to split the discussion in those two streams. So I would spontaneously say that the key part here is like, how do we analyze? So what are the data standards for analysis right now? Um, that would be at least, I think the direction that is maybe a little bit more burning from the data analysis part, because we have so many ways how you can store the data that it's hard to develop computational methods that will be applicable across different modalities right now. So maybe one thing that I can mention is that at the H10, uh, we have a subgroup for highly multiplex imaging where we have now created a metadata standard for highly multiplex images that is really um, built around OME TIFFs, but obviously there's just a lot of metadata that we attach to those OME TIFFs and, and we kind of have this as a level two um, data format and level one are all the raw data types that are there. And then you have this pre-processing step that leads to a common OME TIFF standard that we ideally would like then to use to do segmentation, cell type calling, visualization, and all the other steps, because this will allow us to really process a variety of data um, and not have to convert it. So this is at least what the H10 is currently working on. So maybe we can follow on from the discussion in the uh, antibody staining and multiplex session in the morning, which is what have groups invested in, in terms of generating shared data sets that go to different groups to do cross analysis and look at what the product is and whether you get the same answers, different answers, you know, the dream challenge discussion we had this morning. So maybe you could mention that and talk about what you've already begun doing and then other people can chime in because that's really where the standards are going to come from. Dennis, you're muted. Thank you. We have an effort uh, going on at the H10 that is uh, currently ongoing, a trans network project uh, where we have the same a block of tissue that gets distributed across the centers and then gets uh, analyzed by the different centers. And I think the previous discussion in the morning session was really around the idea of taking uh, different types of data and have a domain expert to really enter um, a ground truth that we can then use for something like a dream challenge. And I, I find this a very interesting idea. I think the bottleneck in my mind currently is really to think about how how do we get this ground truth? What tissue do we use? And how do we really get, con like when you ask three, four different centers, it would already be interesting to just see how much um, variability do we get in the ground truth already that, that we would collect. 
But I would, again, here also open it to discussion and I see Peter raising his hand, so <coughs> next. No, I was just going <clears> to <throat> say, Ron, from that point of view, the one of the things that was set up in HTAN, exactly what Dennis described, was a, a mechanism for these transnetwork projects. Um, and there will be two data sets that should become fairly broadly available over the next couple of months. Um, one of them is on a limited set of samples that have been anal that Dennis is. Um, taking charge of getting organized that are uh, where at least four different technologies have been used on the same specimen, obviously on serial sections from the same specimen. Um, in some cases, they're actually directly adjacent samples because it's the same preparation method. In other cases, they're the same, the same human specimen, but there's a frozen section in an FFPE. And then we have another three-dimensional sort of sampling through normal colon and human colorectal cancer that has 50 serial sections that have been analyzed half by H&E and half by uh, highly multiplex fluorescence. Uh, and the, in fact, the challenge to getting it into the community is actually just the distribution mechanism for that data of that scale hasn't been worked out, but um, there's a fairly substantial effort at the moment to do that. So I think those data sets will be available within you know within six to eight weeks and open up the opportunity really for computational analysis and if anything within h10 there's an effort to accelerate their distribution because i think so many of us have have um people sitting at home i see ron is uh, raising hand there sorry i didn't unraise it okay that's fine um anu Yes, uh, HubMap has a very similar uh, plan. They are, dist they are collecting samples at one center and distributing those among all the HubMap members that are focused on microscope-based imaging. So we will be generating data using our own platforms and comparing against each other. Again, you know what would what be a good, Anu, to that point, what would be a good outcome from even this discussion is to get a list of what those data sets are anticipated to be. Because I think as, as not atypically, quite a few of the efforts are working in parallel. And from an, anal from an imaging standpoint, an analytical standpoint, that's great. But once we get to actually data processing, <laughs> it would be nice to move across data sets. So maybe we could get the various efforts to sort of provide a six month roadmap for what that data will look like. Sure, I will certainly follow up with our microscopy uh, data release team because all this data will be collected and released by them. But we can is, this, is this within Anoop? Is this within HubMap? Well, HubMap plans to share it with everybody. Right. So the, so, the so, image data release plan for HubMap is, I believe, going to be coordinated with HTAN. But I think what we could do is get a common roadmap for it just so that people know when it's coming sorry sure so i think this so is I a guess. great top sorry this is a great topic i think to put on for the longer discussion that will come afterwards uh because then we can also talk about the the details for like a possible uh cross um consortia collaborations or efforts to coordinate those things or discuss with each other um if there's no other questions regarding the standardization i would like to go to the next part to also understand like how do people process how do people visualize their samples especially like do we have the do you have dedicated ways to visualize your samples how do you do it currently what are the bottlenecks for you and is there something that could be an interesting uh, collaboration between uh, again the consortia happening there so i'm opening this up and i see peter is raising his hand just very quickly, Dennis, I just wanted to <clears throat> mention that tomorrow the um, data search and visualization working group is going to tackle some of these issues as well, where we're also going to talk about DICOM, which keeps <laughs> raising its head. So, if, so we will take the notes from this meeting 
from Sinem and Zoltan and already incorporate those into the notes from that. But if anyone's interested in revisiting the topic, it will come up tomorrow afternoon. We may want to focus then on the pre-processing part rather than visualization at this point. Uh, Ron? So something I, we mentioned again this morning is the difference between all the approaches that use formal segmentation and those that are strictly pixel-based. Because in our experience, while there are certain subsets of cells where you can get incredibly high accuracy with automatic segmentation, there are others where, uh, in our experience, all the algorithms we've tried have um, struggled, let me put it that way. Um, and we had our eyes opened by a bunch of computationalists helping us with registration to the fact that if they just did things on a pixel basis, they still wound up generating what appeared to be cellular images with interesting information because of the way that the fluorescent pixels cluster um, when we do our staining. And so we now have an implementation using uh, machine learning networks that uh, approach that. And Andrea, who's on this meeting, generated an 80-plex uh, lymph node image. And we had a very little problem parsing it out using this approach in an automated way. And for the visualization part, um, what this does is do the equivalent of iterative binary gating. So if you have a cell that's got seven markers, it gets automatically identified and essentially colored in that way. And then you can just bring it up and, and view it in a spatial context. And you can also then operate on it to get spatial statistics <coughs> for the neighborhood. So I think we need to discuss the difference between going down a segmentation route and some of these pixel-based um, approaches, which in our experience are more extensible to these very complex data sets. Is there any? I think you're muted. Again. S sorry, I, I you was mute again, sir. Oh no, I was just saying. Is okay. there anyone uh, also just moving kind of the topics up um, before we enter also the segmentation topic? Are there any pre-processing steps that are currently bottlenecks for for different centers? Because I know, for example, imaging mass cytometry or maybe are regions of interest that are selected but then uh, methods like Codex or uh, SISIT are whole slide images, uh, right? How, how do you deal with that? Are there any topics that we would like to, uh, to talk about in, in the next session? Peter? I was just gonna say that, uh, sorry, I was just gonna say that actually, I think um, when we've looked at a fair, when we've looked at data from multiple groups at this point, and I know you've done this as well, Dennis, we have actually, including from the Akoya platform and from, um, and from various multiplex immunohistochemistry, we've actually seen quite a lot of registration problems across, and it, it becomes much more acute um, the larger the specimen, because I think it's both um, a registration issue across channels, but there's also the inevitable spherical apparition on the edges of the imaging field. So I, this has been little discussed in the image, in the data. And there are a fair number of, everyone knows that Hamamatsu and others have commercial platforms in this space and all of their file standards are completely proprietary. So therefore it's almost impossible to figure out what they're doing or figure out how to improve it. So I do think there is need for this fairly early st stitch register and to get standards for that. Um, but in addition, I think <clears throat> it comes back to file formats. Again, I think we have to, as much as possible, encourage commercial vendors to work towards a common standard or the way the bioformats did, group did out of Wisconsin for many years, build converters for that standard. Because if these stitched images, as is I believe true also of the Aperio platform, if they're all proprietary and can't be re-examined, then it'll never be possible either to understand the nature of the problem that they have with registration or to fix it. And, and as, as I say, we could post that data, but I think that whole QC step, Ron pointed out the huge issues that come with segmentation and the advantages of pixels, but even pixel level has to be correctly registered, so. 
So one more comment. Um, so in HubMap, um, because initially there were a lot of groups that used the Acquia platform codec, from Codex, which had you know, kind of proprietary software, they are now trying to utilize or test a few different methods. I think the first one is being Cytokit uh, to, to uh, like process the images later on. And there was like a few weeks ago, a sprint uh, style get together where they actually build the pipeline together for codex data. So I think if other pipelines like Ashlar, for example, can definitely be tested together with those. Um, so there are alternative options. I guess that would be actually very nice. My understanding was that Cytokit actually does not stitch the images. Do you have any other information? Because I think this is what Peter is talking about. Like the registration of the full image, uh, I think is, is one of the steps. So I'm not sure if that is still coming from the Acquia software or not. Uh, some, there, some Gary Nolan Labs available software is, like, is also available as uh, open source, but I think some of that has been incorporated into the Acquia's platform. So I'm not sure if that step is coming already stitched from the Acquia platform or not. That's a good point. But Cytokit itself still handles only uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. It doesn't stitch. I'm in, I'm doing the visualization for yeah. the output of Cytokit. could actually have it up on the screen. I'm looking at a codex image right now. If we just get like one tile at a time. And no, so uh, we, I think can, it's a, we do have software that can stitch. So if you want yeah. to email Dennis, he can send you the, we've now, he's now shown that the uh, uh, Ashlar software can right. stitch for this. But I think the bigger point is for this group and others, sorry, I didn't mean to cut in on you, Ian, but is, is, uh, is, is I think we're going to, I mean, this looks like variant calling and sequencing, right? I mean, it, it doesn't get solved overnight. Um, and I think having some concept of standards and test fixtures and registration, because a lot of data is going to get loaded up with poor registration, and we'll want to know how to get back to it. Um, and one of the big issues that we faced also on the data storage side, I'm sure everyone has, is retaining access to the primary data in order to go back and use improved algorithms is is going to prove a bit of an of of, of a task, and um, and right now little provision has been made for storing that primary data. So as methods improve, we're going to be stuck um, with with the registration that's been done and could be inferior. Um, so I, I think that could be an action item coming out of this. So I'm not a computer scientist, but uh, I'm working with people here at the research. Uh, program with HubMap is actually to do whole slide image res registration and segmentation. So we are going to be developing algorithms that will be freely available to the HubMap members and I'm sure across consortia too. That will allow whole, sl whole slide image registration. Yeah, so are these going to be open source methods or just available methods? Well, uh, so I think I'm the, uh, so we are supposed to be sharing our algorithm with HubMap. I don't know exactly the difference between available versus open source. Yeah, most of the software that, from GE that you've made available is available as executables, but not as open source. And therefore it is of limited utility to the community. Okay, yeah, I, I don't know the details of what we will be supplying to have map, but we can certainly uh, touch base about it later on. Uh, Ron, next. Yeah, Thank you. so a couple of things. There's a group that was in the Library of Medicine that did the original visible human work where they serially sectioned human bodies and did CAT scans. And they had a little line, you know, a couple of billion pixels that were involved there. They're actually the ones that clued us into doing this on a pixel basis. And we've been working with them and they have developed registration algorithms that now work over um, centimeters of imaged material to 80 plex, where you can easily distinguish nuclei and membranes and things as small as lymphocytes. There's, some of those are being installed as plugins in MRS, but Yes, they're you know, government generated open source uh, at the end of the day. Whether they solve all the problems or not, we don't know, but they work on these large tissue scans and do this uh, kind of correction for warping and so on that uh, had been mentioned. So that's um, one aspect 
of this that I think addresses some of the questions here. Um, the other thing is, in terms of pre-processing, uh, Andrea Radke, who's on this call, could um, join in verbally and talk about some of the things, but I'm not sure. I think there's so many different pre-processing steps, depending on how you actually do it, that I'm not sure where that discussion goes right now. So that's really up to Dennis to decide if we go there. But we definitely have tools that improve on the registration for these very complex, I say, 80 parameter full human lymph node scale data sets uh, that actually work. I wouldn't go into it right now, but we can definitely put it for the next session to just discuss whether there are bottlenecks that uh, people in one consortia has that is already solved in another one or potentially that people could work on together. Um, in the next like 10 to 12 minutes, um, I would like to maybe talk about the two last steps of because we talked about data standards, then we talk about pre-processing, potentially segmentation and visualization. And the last steps are obviously to look into cell state calling and also into um, neighborhood analysis. And I was just curious what kind of spatial methods people are currently using or what they are missing in the community that would help them with their work. And I will again open it up for everyone to comment on that. I think at the, at least for a hub map, I guess there aren't very established tools for those purposes yet. So it's still at early stage. I think the first focus was getting the pre-processing and then segmentation, et cetera, at least the consourcing wide effort. So I think that those next steps would definitely be very important. But um, as far as I know, there isn't like a concerted effort on those yet for uh, imaging data. So, yeah. So this is Anup again. We have published uh, a few tools which are looking at neighborhood, neighborhood analysis, the work done by ourselves as well as, as with people at Mayo Clinic. Uh, those uh, tools are published. Uh, I can perhaps share the links with you later on. Okay, so from the current discussion, what I see um, looking into uh, the documents um, that, that, that we have now populated, it seems like that one of the key parts that we can talk about in the breakout session part two, and kind of like how might we, um, and ideas to, uh, for cross consortia collaborations is really looking into the different platforms and how they are processed and also going back to the idea of a potential dream challenge with um, a prior knowledge uh, data or ground truth that will be annotated. And I think this would be great to discuss maybe in more detail later. Something that I would also like to hear more about and maybe we can also discuss this in the next session is what, what Ron mentioned was to use segmentation free approaches and one of the things would be also to to see how does it compare to segmentation based approaches and what can they recover and what are they missing and um, and vice versa. Um, is this something that people would be interested to discuss and potentially look also into like um, cross consortia collaborations there. Did I miss something so I'm, I'm opening this up for the next uh, 10 minutes Emma. Yes, this was regarding the dream challenge. I was wondering if you also consider talking to Kaggle. So we are planning our second challenge there and they do pro bono challenges and also contribute with prize money sometimes. And it's a, also a pretty good platform that reaches out to the computational community beyond biomedical research. So I think that's worth uh, at least uh, thinking of um, in, in, well, complementary to dream challenge. I think we use dream challenge as a challenge, uh, kind of very generic, but I think it's definitely a possibility also to do it in Kaggle. I really like the one, by the way, with this single. Uh, could, 
Yeah, because there's been quite a lot of uh, recent uh, segmentation challenges and related challenges, and that's a good thing because the, the participants tend to participate in challenges where they have some previous work they can build on. So you probably have a pretty large user base there that would love to do such a project, I would guess. Agreed. We should return in the afternoon to the question of procuring enough tissue to do the cross comparisons across uh, platforms uh, and with different analysis methods in addition to whatever we curate for um, a challenge. Agree. Um, if there are no other questions, I would just uh, do the 15 minute break now and we will return um, with the with the larger session to discuss the details and the problems that we could tackle. Um, if there's no other questions, then I will just. Act yes. So actually, before we track, we have a question for Emma. Since Emma, since you have been involved with the Human Protein Atlas, you must have given a lot of thought about the ground truth that uh, we've been talking about. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I have a lot of thoughts on that. <laughs> Maybe yeah. too much for this. Uh, forum, but ground truth is very, very important. But also, if you have a lot of data, you can tolerate noise in your ground truth. Because when you do build machine learning models, you basically want the models to be able to handle noise. So it's not mm -hmm. good ground truth is good, but it doesn't have to be perfect. So I, I, I tend to be rather pragmatic in building ground truth data sets rather than aiming to be perfect. Because we're still a far away from perfect, so we don't have to aim at perfect directly. That's my opinion. Thank you. And I also think that there are great, there are ways to crowdsource ground truth. Markups, for example, I know, I'm sure we'll see a lot of that for COVID related, like x-rays and CTs, for example, to engage the public in marking up images and segmenting cells. and, and posting, adding some projects to Zooniverse or something like that. It's not a big amount of work. And I think it could be worth considering crowdsourcing that as well, because it is tedious work. Now you have a lot of school kids at home that might need science projects to do. So it could be good timing. I think I would um, start the session now. Um, once again, if you want to say something, either just say it out loud or raise your hand and I will try to um, to keep an eye on the participant list. For the last uh, or for the second breakout session, the idea is really to create this final template um, where we want to have a collaboration that we would like to have uh, across the consortia. And my feeling from this conversation was that the challenge to define cell types uh, across highly multiplex imaging technologies is kind of something that would address a lot of different challenges that we have discussed, I think, this morning, as well as now, to really find the different standards, compare how are the different uh, segmentation or non-segmentation methods perform, and so on. So our goal here is um, to really think about five or more uh, possible ways to move forward with such a collaboration. And I just open it up and, and I would like to just have a lively discussion on that. So the clear question is, how do, we, how do we move forward with a potential challenge? How do we set this up? What are the possible ways to do it? Who would be willing uh, to, um, to help with that? Can you make your screen just a little bit bigger? I like the shared screen version of this. Okay, sure. Um, yes. As I said, you can also um, access this yourself. So this is the, we don't have any notes yet. So it looks quite yeah. empty. Um, so one thing, um, so I don't know what other consortia are doing about this problem at the moment. Are there, if there are already 
like pipelines being built or not, but um, it, maybe there might be, you know, this idea of doing things in sprint, but this time a cross collaboration sprint of some sort to build a pipeline from existing tools uh, that could actually be applied to different types of multiplex image data for this like, you know, higher level processing and analysis could be an interesting approach. Your so would you see this as before we do the challenge or after? So what means do we run first the challenge, identify the best methods, the, the kind of the winning uh, processing steps and then pull it all together in like the, the best version? So if, if there will be a challenge, probably it's better to do that afterwards. Uh, or alternatively, this could be like a, instead of a challenge, you know, a concerted development effort that can be done together instead of like people doing development by themselves and then trying to compare them later. You know, I just wanted to think, say that I think that Sanam's point is a good one is that <clears throat> somehow we want, you know, in these kind of things, you want a sort of test set and a training set and a validation set, which sort of has the feeling of a challenge, but the, you know, people always like those dream challenges. Um, actually, it's the other way around Zoltan. I think it's training, uh, test, and then validation. But the, um, but the problem with the dream challenges is it's a pretty heavyweight enterprise and you always have to hold a substantial amount of data set back for the gold standard. So although I think we and many others consortia propose that as part of their plans, it, it doesn't seem to me realistic at the moment in terms of how fast things are moving. So, um, so maybe there's, a, there's another way, a kind of hackathon way, or there's a way to compress this cycle down so that it's much more responsive. Um, and you know, the main thing, the, the main issue with the way, uh, um, it's done in uh, in 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 the in the, in the formal test is it's essential that the validation data be kept secret and or not leak back into the training data so that you have a truly independent sets but i think in this case we're not planning to give anyone a reward or a publication per se so maybe there's i say there's just a way to achieve a similar goal but in a much lighter weight more rapid effect and a, a method it seems to me from the discussion I heard earlier, Peter, somebody else, maybe the very first step, since people with the different platforms, whether it's MIBI or Codex or, or, or I'm, our method or your method, should be willing to exchange some data to other labs who think they have good algorithms, let them process it and see if it looks anything like what we got looking at our own data. That that's a very, very simple first step first step. We've actually run some of the published MIBI data, for example, using the pixel-based approach that Nishant, who's on this call, uh, developed in the lab called Rapid, um, and it works quite well. So we know we can push it over to another platform, uh, at least in, in comparison to the process data that was published. Uh, we don't know what else, you know, those folks did in, in cleaning it up or getting it to that stage. So that might be a first step, and then as people sort of filter out or figure out whether their approaches are at all extensible or not, then it may make it more interesting to go to the, the formal challenge on sort of gold standard data sets. You know, in the tissue case, I mean, the one area where if we got a couple of common data sets, this is, I think, a continuation of what we were talking about before to find out what efforts are ongoing between the various projects to build some common data sets with different technologies. I think it's exactly what Ron was saying. Um, I think the, the one thing you would want to do once in that is probably get the human curation correct. Um, and, you know, I think this may not be such a bad time to do it. it the issue is that it's 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 fairly labor intensive and manual, but particularly on tissues, typically need some with a fair amount of knowledge of tissue biology. But you know, I know even in our institution, there are a fair number of pathology fellows who are currently idle. Um, 
And so it's not a bad time to help establish, to work on a human ground truth annotation of a common set of data. So were we to go and gather together all the projects that are proposing, let's say in the next month or two to collect data that could be distributed that was of the right scale, we could probably organize a common effort to, um, to, to get the annotation working. Philip, are you going to survive that? Or are you? <laughs> I was just informed we are on lockdown now. So. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> My son is excited. Apologies. Of course. Anyway, I think there's a pretty clear action item in terms of organizing resources and distributing them and, and making people aware of what's out there across all these many programs that could be, could yield a lot of these. And then people can begin to plug their algorithms in. So do I understand uh, correctly that one of the first steps that we can now do is also to think about how we do the ground truth annotation through people, like through domain experts? Is this one of the first steps that we will do with the data that we have so far? Check whether this is sufficient and then go to like a, a data set designed to do a challenge afterwards? Well, I think if we knew what I think we're talking, there's single cell work, of course, and then there's tissue work and they're different. And it's a different expertise that one needs, but just for the moment to stick with tissue, which is um, less worked on. I think if we could have in some relatively near term, a list of, you know, here are four data sets, I'm making the number up, of course, but you know, here are four data sets that consortia are planning to distribute over the next couple of months or month, we could, begin to solicit people who feel comfortable in their annotation. And I think the very fact, even if it's a huge amount of human labor, the fact that it's going to be reused many times is gonna make it much more attractive um, to people. Uh, and so I think that's, that would be it, I think. And, and you could also let people a little bit choose what they want to annotate. You know, uh, in our experience, a histopathologist is gonna be much more comfortable annotating something where he has approximate or she has approximate H and E image in order to look at what the, what their conventional experience is. So, so I think those kind of things would let us get to the ground truth data set efficiently, but also make optimal use of a limited resource. Can I add into the last comment that Peter made about H and E? So we've actually worked out a pipeline where we go back to H and E at the end of the fluorescent imaging match the pathology. And so black areas where you didn't get stained because you didn't include the right probe set are no longer black and you sort of know what's there. And uh, we can discuss that with people, but there that ought to be included um, for obvious reasons. Can, uh, hey, it's Neil. Can I, can I throw out something from uh, in high orbit around uh, this, this group? Uh, the thing that Peter mentioned earlier about FFPE versus frozen tissue, um, the difference in antigens is extreme in terms of epitopes and what's presented to, to an antibody or affinity reagent. So I, I wondered if that would be captured in this study. And I'd just love to know of the current group, you know, what kind of global percentage is FFPE versus frozen tissue with maybe more native antigens. Like I, I'm just trying to get a sense of that for my own edification. Well, one thing I can say in our experience is um, it depends a little bit on the specimen. So one thing with, you know, F, the antibodies that work well for FFPE, I think that's what you're pointing out, Neil, and the ones that work on a frozen OCT are different. Um, and often the ones that work on FFPE will in many, but not all cases work even better on OCT, um, th that is to say frozen. But the, um, the morphology is much harder, to, it's much harder to get high quality, high morphology, high grade, I should say grade is the wrong word, but high quality um, frozen sections than it is FFPE. So that's one issue as you get to better resolution. Um, but the, the, and clinical process is primarily FFPE. But what we found in HTAN is those early stage tumors where you're largely working off of archives um, or you're working off of very, very small specimens, which are necessarily subject 
to diagnostic analysis by H&E are almost all FFPE. So in H10, the preclinical atlases are sort of stuck with FFPE and then a very limited amount of native um, tissue, which can be used for other technologies. Obviously, when you have large tumors, you're in, or you particularly have a neoadjuvant setting, um, or that would be in the case of any warm autopsy protocol, then, then you have ready availability of large amounts of, of frozen tissue. Um, but in the disease setting, anything that's subject to biopsy that's followed by a diagnostic analysis, typically the research setting is secondary to the clinical setting. And, and that means you, you get a process, you get H&E uh, on FFPE almost always as, as your primary material. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and so that that explains why so much in the imaging is has been FFPE, and it carries forward for those reasons. But the, um, is there a desire to go uh, more frozen and OCT embedded tissue, or would or would you rather uh, it, it, without that historical reason to drive FFPE, or is it, are they roughly equivalent in the imager's mind? I think we could throw it out to the general group. The, I mean, in general, F, the quality of preservation of FFPE is exceptionally good. Um, and if you have a good clinical protocol in place, you're going from resection to fixative really quickly. I mean, within five minutes in some cases. So you have a, a well-established pre-analytical workflow. Um, I think that's the advantage. The disadvantage is nothing to do, it's not imaging per se. I think it's all the other ancillary work everything to do with RNA DNA becomes much harder. Um, so, you know, spatial transcriptomics, et cetera, uh, is, is largely worked out for frozen sections. So I think the advantage of frozen is less in the imaging space, particularly given the preservation issue, because you have this problem with ice crystals um, and much more in the molecular space where molecular analysis is much more favorable on frozen. All right, thanks. We sure. should point out no, actually but, uh, though that there are a much, sorry, I don't, I'm sorry, just one quick thing. There okay. are actually a lot of other preparations that, that are probably relevant to the larger group, right? Like blood cells are largely mounted in Gimza stains. So they're different stains. Some of them are alcohol fixed. We've actually had surprisingly good work of results with uh, decalcified marrow and things. So I actually think there's actually a much wider range of preparations that are relevant to this, particularly as we go more and more for clinical specimen. Um, the alveolar lavage, for example, that is relevant to the COVID ep epidemic. So, so, so actually think right now we've tended in most of the studies to be between sort of fixed either FFPE or some kind of alcohol method generally for isolated cells and this huge range of clinical specimens, all of which are in principle addressable with these technologies. Anup, you wanted to say something? No, I was just going to say that uh, HubMap is planning to release some data sets in a few months, and there will be more coming later this year. So the uh, Peter's idea of getting some of these annotated, uh, I was wondering if we can, I mean, it's a lot of work, so can we do some crowdsourcing for that? I think that maybe also to just briefly comment, I think uh, going towards our goal for the breakout session is also to discuss the next items, right? How do we address uh, this kind of questions? And I feel like one of the key points that I just see is that the individual consortia will release a data sets. So potentially whatever is possible to kind of already in the next meeting to discuss what kind of data sets will get released what kind of antibody sets are there, which, which methods. And I think then we will have pretty much a good idea for the next steps. What, what are we gonna have in the next three months or potentially even shorter? And then we could use the lockdown right now to actually annotate uh, those data sets. Mm -hmm. So one thing I would caution about is these antibody data sets. So antibodies are validated to work with different platforms. So depending on how the different platforms process the tissue, 
that may affect the antibody validation process. So whatever different groups submit as their antibodies may not translate to other platforms. Which I guess is part of the challenge, right? To define yeah. computational pipelines or workflows that, that show you what is reproducible and what is too sensitive for the underlying um, processing variability. I mean, Emma is an expert in all of this, but one thing you see with multiplex methods and tissues and cells is they actually afford an excellent opportunity to do cross antibody validation at the pixel level, right? No segmentation at all. So um, in the oncology case where you have very controversial antigens like PDL1, for example, we'll sometimes take multiple channels all for the same analyte but with a different antibody. So, um, so I think that's a, the, the, I think your point of noob is a good one. And I think um, over time, we're going to work out better and better ways to share that primary validation data. Um, one thing that we've been doing a lot is, and I think many others is validating against clinical standards, um, the approved standards for laboratory developed tests, which one finds in some cases are actually inferior to what is available in research reagents. So. Um, that's going to be an interesting development, I think, over time as well. So, so Peter, uh, on the uh, LDTs you just mentioned, that when, when someone devises an LT, LDT for their local uh, use, they expose publicly the, the validation data behind it? extremely rare to do so, partly because remember pathology is not yet digital. So the first whole side scanners, I think DGE even had some were, are 15 years old, but it was only two, a year and a half ago that the FDA allowed a practicing pathologist to use a digital setup to make a diagnosis. So hospitals are only going digital with H&E right now. Um, but I think the, and, wow. and so LDT data is run against an internal standard. Um, I think as a result of these consortia, the ones we're all in, I think we will make it much easier for hospitals and, and CLIA labs to expose their, their standards. And I think that'll be fantastic, um, particularly because the whole concept of a laboratory developed test is now, well, not after COVID-19, but before that was under threat from the FDA as well. So there are going to be a couple of uh, meetings this coming year, if anyone's interested in this group, bringing the FDA together with um, both research and clinical imaging to get a better sense of what that landscape will look like. So looping back to the question of making something like a challenge, um, I would like to reach out to Emma if she's still on the call to maybe hear, like, how do you set up, what are the first steps to create this kind of challenge? What are the challenges for the challenge? It, it's, I would say that thinking hard about how you design the data sets, the training data set and the test data set and the validation data set, because they have to be balanced in a good way and you have to have enough data that you can withhold from the participants and enough data that they can train on and so on and, and then do a lot of QC to make sure that there's no you know leakage between the data sets or other leaked images out there think of if you want people to also use external data or not use external data there's different pros and cons of doing that depending on what you want the outcome to be so I would say usually you have to think about what, what's the outcome what do we want and how do we optimize for that? Because most challenge platforms will allow you to, for example, use one parameter for ranking the solutions. So which, and that parameter, the choice of that parameter will guide what your participants do because people want to win. They don't necessarily want to develop the best, best method for your task, but to be cynical, they want to develop whatever that ranks them highest on the leaderboard. So you have to think hard about this. Like how do we make sure that they and I think that the, the job that we have to do as scientists is to frame the question clear enough and make the data set so good so that any computational scientist can do it, do it. So we don't have to, you should not be, you should not um, 
need domain knowledge in order to participate in a challenge. And I think that's, to me, that's the difference between a less successful challenge would be one where the top ranking ones are people with domain knowledge. Whereas a successful challenge is one where the top ranking ones might work at, I don't know, Walmart as a data analyst or something, because the question was framed so well so that they knew exactly what to do and they could develop great models. And that's usually when you get the best models. Is it possible to have multiple questions so that we kind of have like multiple steps of depth that we want to we wanna get out? Usually, I, I don't know how Dream, Dream does that kind of tiered competitions, I think. I know Kaggle, they don't do that and you can only compete against one thing. But on the other hand, they, ran, they run competitions for three months and then they often have another competition based on that. So they tend to launch separate competitions. So then you can think about what do we want first and how, depending on how good that was, you can do the second challenge and so on. So I, I think it's easier. Well, it depends on your, if your audience is mainly the people, do you plan to crowdsource to like a very wide computational community? Or do you think that the people that work with image analysis of multiplex images are, are a good enough audience? Because depending on that, you might frame it. You can also make just a sandbox with benchmark data sets that all of you and, and our community can play and work with and, and upload our models to. And that might be sufficient. It might accelerate the development enough at this point. Do we even Emma, expect- Emma, that's what I was going to ask you actually suggest the same as the kind of a, uh, you know, a sandbox with, um, with validation data for the internal community as a near-term goal that can move us quite quickly. And then- once we understand, I think, a little more about the data and have a little more maybe basic information in place, the more ambitious outsourced goal would seem yeah. would actually work even better. Um, so think, have I you had experience with those kind of sandbox type challenges? A, a, little, a little bit. Uh, and I think that's a very wise uh, kind of route to take because I, as I understand it by listening to you right now, you don't even know if there will be one solution for all of you at the moment. And before you know that, you don't really know which challenge to prioritize. Is it to make one solution that works across the different imaging modalities or is it to tailor them? It, it's a lot of open questions. So I think to, it, it's wise to hold up with a big challenge and make a sandbox for all of you to cross compare on your, your data sets. And we have actually, we have built one platform. It's called imjoy.io. Link it to you. So it's basically a browser based platform for deployment of deep learning models where you can also connect to data sets. And we're also building a image a model suit together with um, Florian Jag, the creator of Fiji, and the Elastic team, for example, where we want to make deep learning models for different types of image processing available. In, power it by a sort of bio engine so that it's easily available one by one click and you can basically click and say, I want to run this model locally. I want to run it with Fiji. I want to run it with Elastic or I want to run it with the Python code or whatever you want to do. So I think that there are emerging platforms like this that you can use as a sandbox, but then you can clone it. It's fully open. It's on GitHub. You can clone it and make one that is exclusive for your team, or you can withhold the data sets and not share that with everyone else, but still put your models up there. So I definitely think that there are, emerging sandboxes to explore. And this is a pretty nice pilot uh, group of people for pilot experiment, I would say. And yeah, I would, the, I, for the Emma, bio I'd, image, I've seen the Imjoy before, but yeah. bio, your bioimage.io here with your model zoo, et cetera, looks, looks ideal actually. Yeah, so that one is very much in the making. We have no dedicated funding yet, but we've applied for a lot of grants and we've started to implement models and we have the whole, we've designed the architecture so we know exactly what the bio engine will look like and how it can communicate with these different platforms. So if people, and we want this to be a community project. So if you want to have several or a few representatives that help us to do that, we would be more than happy to do so. And we'll be happy to help out to implement any models that you already have if you want to test it. So just let us know. But there, for the, for the bioimage one, we would love to see more people engaged. That looks great. Are you actually looking for some engineering assistance as well on that? Or? Absolutely. Okay, we'll be in touch maybe. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. It looks really cool.
<laughs> uh, by the way, Zoltan or, or, or Finan, there's a way to capture the, in case they sign us out, there's a way to capture the chat if you want to. I don't know if you guys found that tool. You might want to just occasionally capture the chat so that it doesn't disappear. I think Otherwise, Zoltan, when they sign us out. Zoltan saved, saved it last, last time. time. Yeah. Okay, good. Excuse I did not, me. but somebody did. I did. I, I, you I, did. Okay, okay. one of you did. Randomly, yeah. And I just posted into the Google Docs. And and also I, I just want to say so for example for Imjoy we're currently building some we're implementing Comid for example so that you can do markups of lung X-rays and things like that for to help COVID related research and if there's functionalities that you would want to see there uh, let us know and and because we always prioritize based on what the community wants so just reach out if there's things that you would want to add or if there's things that you would functionalities you would want to see. And if, if you plan to, you can reach out to me offline also if you want to discuss challenges in, in greater detail. We put a lot of thought of it uh, into it over the years. So I'll be happy to share all our thoughts so far. The uh, one thing that came to my mind now when I started to kind of write down what are the steps uh, that we want to take is we, we kind of discuss from like the image perspective. Once we have the image, we have the stitch, uh, it's, it's already like pre-processed, and then we do the cell tap calling. Do we also want to include something into the sandbox, how to get to the pre-processed data and whether we want to like have something like a standard procedure or at least common QC steps? Is this something that people would be interested in? I think it would be great to have the option to have those steps also be run through the sandbox. Like it might be an optional because if people are using a different pipeline, they can also start a step later, but it would be also great to have that possibility if they want to start directly from the raw data essentially, and then going to there. Yeah, I also see the other opportunity is that we could change the parameters and the pre-processing and kind of see how actually the end result of the data analysis changes. That would also show you like how sensitive it is for the pre-processing part. I mean, and there, if there are alternative pre-processing pipelines, they could be maybe incorporated so people actually can try different ones and then that would be really nice. Agreed. So I keep the forum open for further discussions. I think for the last uh, 15 minutes, um, well, we have now even more than half an hour left, but if there's no other discussions, what we could do is to really look into the Google Docs and try to come up with like a, a plan for the next steps and who would be, who would like to take a uh, lead on that or at least uh, push this forward and, and discuss the next steps, what would be necessary to actually get to such a sandbox to really share what kind of data we're going to share in the next few months and what would be necessary to um, to create this kind of challenge. This this sounds good? Yeah. Dennis, let me make a comment that pertains to this pre-processing. So one of the things that, that we've been trying to do on and off with Aviv is compressed sensing. Um, and the big problem we kept running into there is the different intensity of stains that we couldn't normalize within the combinatorials that we were working on. If you go back to even just the regular imaging and some of the uh, methods I was talking about earlier, when you think you've run the same set of stains on the same turns out that if you normalize across the samples, you run into very big problems because if they're not collected on the same instrument at exactly the same settings with exactly the same batches of antibody under exactly the same staining conditions. It isn't that the specificity has really changed, but the intensities change and the normalization really doesn't work uh, especially well across the samples. 
So one question for everything we've been talking about uh, <clears throat> is whether we need to have essentially on slide standards that provide a basis for doing the normalization where all the batching that I've just talked about is controlled. And I don't know how many other people have run into that. There are certain technologies where that's not even practical. Um, how do we handle that in getting to the point of the data sets we're talking about to do the other analyses? I think you brought up a very good point, Ron. Normalization is actually a big issue that we've been looking into. And uh, I, even with the on-slide controls, we are finding that you need not just one or two controls, you need multiple controls to actually get good normalization of data. I don't know what your experience has been with that, but certainly if you have done some of this, perhaps you can share that. You know, one, Ron, uh, one issue that is a bit, seems a little awfully tangential, but um, maybe the group has experienced is, you know, one of the challenges in these areas of image processing that you're describing is historically, there's been a pretty low level of interest in, in journals and in publishing them. Um, and so, although there is a, there's a lot of work out there on, you know, new imaging methods. So if you've got a new method, you're, you're in good shape, but all of this sort of underlying image processing, there's nothing like the sort of rich community that there is for bio and, you know, for sort of sequence based bioinformatics. But I think that's changing. And actually, I know I've had discussions with several journal editors recently who would be interested in that. So I think, although it seems awfully old fashioned, you know, one of the things to encourage people is as algorithms come together and um, are, are ready for release to actually publish them and actually get them out the door. And I, I, you know, I would say that our lab, my lab is absolutely guilty of this. You know, we stick them in GitHub and we hope people find them, but we found publishing over the years to be so challenging that we've sort of half given up. And I, and I think that's a very defeatist thing. So I think these issues like normalization, registration, et cetera, um, there is stitching and registration algorithms built into image J, but you know, you won't find much of a literature on them at all over the last 10 years. And yet they're just as fundamental as alignment of sequence. So, um, so anyway, I know it's a sort of a weird observation to make, but I think, you know, we could even solicit the right journals and say, look, you know, and, and, you know, getting into scientific reports or, you know, it doesn't all need to be in, in, in the fanciest schmanciest would, would really help because I actually think we just see a lot more interest in the field and a lot more uh, development of, of follow on solutions. Well, I had an interesting, several interesting conversations with journal editors where I pointed out problems with um, the way people were presenting data, CFSE data, uh, 2D imaging data. And the reaction was they don't wanna be publishing things that are not real. They just don't know that they're not real and even their so-called expert reviewers don't always tell them they're not real. So I think, especially with the growing interest in using imaging in the, the tumor immunotherapy area where there's tons of stuff floating around, that editors are going to be very aware that they need to have papers that are based on these technologies up to snuff and so getting some of the standards in, I think, is going to be a bit easier than it was in the past if one makes those arguments, if it also isn't just one individual always trying to push their take on it, but if there are these consortium type articles that here's best practices to really you know, create a standard that matters. Um, well, I think the other thing to think about, and we have Rita actually on board here, so we can even ask her to comment. I mean, I think one of the issues is that, that I think is relevant to this and also to the meeting we're doing. Um, um, just a second, Rita, you'll have to uh, unmute mute yourself. But I was gonna say that is relevant to, the, um, to this topic is the absence of primary data has made it impossible in general to go back and and, and actually test algorithms. So if somebody in sequencing space goes and says they have a better variant calling algorithm, 
anybody who's interested downloads a sequence and sees whether it works. And you know, the JCB deployed an Omero-based repository for all of its image data over 10 years ago now. Um, Jason Swedlow's group helped them and it was abandoned as uneconomic five years later. And so what you actually get for the data that we're all producing in this domain with fancy schmancy immunosaber methods is 300 pixels square typical fields of view, right? So I think if we can solve through these efforts, the issue of data release and data distribution, we will also go a long way to addressing the issue of algorithm reliability and reproducibility. Yeah, I don't have much to add there other than I agree. I think the image data repositories have led We can't uh, do well. Um, all of you, can you hear me? There's like an echo. Oh. Okay, sorry. No, it's it's fine. I, I was just checking what, like whether it's coming from someone, but I think everyone is muted. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I was just gonna say that, you know, for whatever reason, image data repositories have lagged far, far behind um, other large data sets. And I don't know if it's because the heterogeneity of the data or the sheer size, maybe the community isn't, um, Historically, they don't have to share all their data. Usually you have one or two beautiful figures in your paper and that supports your point rather than sharing all the images you ever acquired of something. But I mean, I think that's going to be a, a big thing moving forward, especially as we see things like machine learning and deep learning. We need a huge amount of training, annotated training data. I think the sharing is going to become imperative. Sorry, I stepped out a little bit, so I'm sorry if I repeated something somebody already said. I think the size of data is definitely a big issue because we are routinely generating five, 10 terabytes of data for any study we do. Supporting that amount of data on somewhere is going to be a big issue. Can I, uh, Peter, I've been trying to follow along here and also what you're saying now um, on screen, uh, you said, you know, it's a, it's a problem to only see like these 300 pixels of data I know you worked on Omera. Are you saying that it's like a it's, there's a hurdle, there's like a technical boundary, there's a technical and cost boundary towards putting your data out publicly and visualizing it, or were you sort of referencing something else? Because I'm just trying to understand if you were saying like the issue is communicating what's in like communicating the imagery and what the data reflects um, quickly, or like in terms of a technical debt type of thing, or if you were saying something else. Well, I think I was saying that uh, the, the, these higher, these more complicated issues that Ron was talking about, do algorithms actually work or that Rita was mentioning, they actually come back to the fact that there is nowhere to put your data. I mean, there is no geo of images. And, um, and, and the, the, the only work that's been done in this space has been done in Europe and it's way ahead. In fact, the Omero project actually started in, in, in the US and moved to Europe because it could get zero funding here. So it's just never been anyone's priority and it's never been funded. That doesn't, I'm not, I don't think revisiting that history is helpful, but I think it is worth saying that all of these tissue atlases now represent an opportunity to do that. But I think what's noteworthy for this group, and we found this in HTAN, is the vast majority of the effort in the tissue images in the US, or sorry, tissue projects in the US is on sequencing data. And very little thought has been given, at least in HTAN. Um, uh, it's, it's coming along, but relatively little thought has been given to dealing with the issue of images, partly. And so it always sort of gets pushed to the back. And so therefore, to Rita's point, it's not of that much interest. And I think what's particularly concerning is it doesn't attract really good bioinformatics and computational people to do it because there's no equivalent of you know image net where you can go to and find 50 tissues. And, so, so I think it's I think it these it's sort of a self reinforcing circle, and so as a, the absence of the access to the primary data or to really good high resolution data, honestly outside of European context, makes it hard to attract people to the problem, and so then there's less attention, and it becomes a self reinforcing thing. And we were 
further ahead, I would argue, 10 years ago than we were today. Okay. Um, so, but do you think that it's a, there's a visualization aspect to it? Because I know that was mentioned earlier. Or do you think it's really just where do we host the data? Oh, I think, I, I, sorry, I was being obscure. I think visualization analysis, pixel level versus, those are all the interesting questions. How we host and distribute the data is not that, it's not that interesting a question. But my argument for you to disagree with is that the absence of the data makes it hard to actually tackle the more interesting problem. So I think the visualization, all those things exist, but you know, when you had a genome's worth of data and you couldn't look at it, the pressure to develop a good genome data browser was incredibly high. And that mm. I think is, is part of what's contributed to the absence of these tools in image space. Okay, that was interesting. I'm just wondering, because uh, right now we're working on like this web, I don't know if Niels, I don't know if you've talked to my PI Niels before about this, but we're working on a web-based thing. So that's why I was kind of wondering about it. We're working on sort of a more cloud native viewer for this data. Yeah. We're going to be working, uh, you're in the same department, you're in a different department at Harvard, and notwithstanding that, we will be allowed to work together. So actually, okay. HubMap and HTAN are going to host, we think are going to, it's just up under review by NIH, but we're probably going to review our, put our data in the first, same place in the beginning. So let me make a comment, because I've been talking to Jan Allenberg and the MBL people and the ones that are very involved in the European consortium you're talking about, Peter. And they have expressed a very strong interest in um, not having America have to reinvent the wheel, but building off of the infrastructure they've now created to do this. So I think an action item is to get in touch with the folks that are running the European group at a minimum to get sort of what did they work out to get it off the ground now so we don't have to, re to, to restart all over again. But there may even be a way to do some linkage. Um, to that and, and get a head start on creating the kind of shared database with quality images you're talking about. So I wouldn't uh, suggest we just start all over again. So Ron, we can definitely follow up with that, notwithstanding your absence of the appropriate America first approach here. Um, <laughs> uh, I did wanna say the actual implementation that the HTAN, um, HubMap group are looking at is IDR. So it's the next implementation of the image data resource, which is built at the EBI. So it would be exactly that. It actually would just iterate on that infrastructure one more time. So we would make use of those lessons that would not reinvent. Exactly. Which is under its hood, actually part of Jason Swedlow's Omero project. So my understanding is that also the question of like how to host and visualize those images would also be addressed with kind of the challenge idea to pull all the data together in like a common space. Or do we want to separate those things as like two different ways where people could uh, collaborate across consortia? I think what Peter's talking about is a much more extensive set of sort of all the data that's being created, not the smaller subset you would operate on to test algorithms and, and best practices. So I think they're two different, they're related but separate um, enterprises. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go back to the, to the other issue about um, you know, what do we want to look at, the sandbox, et cetera, and point out that we really have talked about a, at least a two by two matrix here. We'd like the same images to be analyzed by different people using different analytical methods. And we want the same tissues to be analyzed by different people using different wet tissue uh, technology, separate from the post analysis. And so we need to cross over in, in, in both uh, dimensions. We'd like maybe to be looking at the same tissues that any of the different fluorescent methods look at. And we would like data from both of those to be looked at by the computational people. So you have to have that matrix set up in trying to do even the sandbox approach. And it sort of pulls out the different pieces. Um, that's not so easy because the same tissue across platforms requires real organization at the wet lab level. It's not everything that's just sitting there online for people to operate on. So I think that has to be uh, taken into account. 
Ron, I think one thing uh, that I think was just asked too, I say, I, I, we would have to check with, we'll have to check back with the program on this, but I, I, I suspect Philip's on the call. I think he would be supportive. I think the, this American or this US based IDR like instance, um, I think it could be used and it's going to be up and running hopefully within four to six weeks uh, between HTAN and um, <clears throat> HubMap could be used to host the sandbox. Um, that is to say to host the primary data and we can mirror that in uh, the European instance in order to produce faster access. So, so I actually think that, that it's, it's a bit trivial, but insofar as we were trying to think about how to move the sandbox forward, if we could do that while also supporting, um, I think the tools that, that we saw from Emma, I think that would be a very powerful combination and get us to that sort of sandbox inter-technology combination, you know, within, by late spring, which would, because I think that's the thing is how do we get started? It would be the practical thing of starting. So I, I think we, that infrastructure would be usable in combination with Emma's quite quickly, if there was for, interest, I should say. For operating at the computational level on data that exists, yes. But what I was saying is we need a second dimension of taking tissue samples, your adjacent slices as we were talking about before, <clears throat> from what Dennis was going about and testing it on the different platforms so that they can also be cross compared. And I'm not sure those data will wind up in that repository in any time soon, because I'm not sure except for the one effort that Dennis talked about that's actually being done and not to the high multiplex we're talking about. Well, we would have had, it's a great question. I can't fully answer that. The, the HTAN would have had such a data set across five technologies by end of May. Of course, that's not now going to happen. So I think we'll try to get some limited data sets. We have three tissue sections that are across four technologies right now. And then we have a couple of technologies that are across 10 or 20 sections. So, so I think we've been working with our program to try to accelerate the release of what might be conventionally thought a slightly incomplete data set, just because there's not going to be a lot of data collection for the next a couple of months. So I, I think it's not quite zero and it's not quite what you're looking for, Ron, it's somewhere in between. Um, also the two of the, these two things can be done, you know, separately. Uh, so like the building, you know, computational tools and comparing them can be done independent of doing the validations or cross comparison of the imaging methods. In the end, the type of data will be quite similar. So the processing pipelines and analysis can be done independent of you know, those type of wet lab based methods as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the idea, you're absolutely right. So I think the goal here is to facilitate, is to, for this group to think of, you know, three practical, I'm making the number up, but three practical steps that could facilitate that. So um, going back, I, I don't know if there is an entity from um, H10 that is really tasked with this type of computational tools. So HubMap has the Hive component that is tasked for the, in, like, you know, the data portal, as well as the computational tool management. And they have been organizing these sprint type of events where people come together virtually or on site and then create new pipelines or at least discuss all the problems related to an analysis routine and so on. And I think they had some success. Uh, we can find out exactly who the right people would be to talk to, but that might be an interesting example to bring together some people from H10, some people from HubMap and other interested consortia who can actually bring together tools or different expertise to build something together. And there could be options to test out different pipelines as well, or if there aren't alternatives available, or if, if it's already clear that somewhat something is you know, very advantageous, that can be used for the time. And then if there will be a challenge later on, some of these can be updated as well. So just to get a kickstart. Yeah, so I think actually for the, uh, it's a great point for the, um, for the Google Doc there, we said an HTAN data set is one, there may be others, but I think it should specifically mention the Hive from HubMap. So the, there's a similar effort in HTAN called the DCC, but the Hive in HubMap is further along. It's just down at point three. You said, you know, use this, but Sanem, I think, 
point is pointing out down there, whoever that whoever's at that cursor that the hot yeah, the hub map hive is the is the thing. Dennis, I think you're on mute. Thank you very much. Um, I was just saying, I, I wanted to say that the green part will have the detailed protocol that I'm just showing. And Sinem and Zoltan were writing um, the protocol up here and I, and here I would just like to summarize like our recommendations and the next steps uh, a little bit more concrete uh, so that we can show it to during the plenary. So please take a look at it and I open it up for discussion. I mean, we were kind of writing while we were talking. So um, I think it would be great to kind of distill what we want to do. My understanding was that we have, that the idea is that we're going to collect some ground truth data uh, and then put it in a sandbox. Um, I also think that we can use H10 and hub map data uh, and then really understand what data sets are coming, what technologies are used, what antibody panels and which tissues. And then also think about how do we create the sandbox. And I really like that year by Synum to actually have something like a hackathon or sprint to build the basic infrastructure and then host it uh, as Peter has suggested. Are there any other points or something that I have missed and, or we should do a separate uh, final template. I mean, we are not limited to just having one proposal. Yeah, Dennis, let's, um, the only other thing is let's make sure we have whatever is up there. Let's make, I think it's implicit in what you have. Let's make sure we have a good, I think it's points two and three. Let's definitely investigate Emma's solution for the sandbox and make sure that we have a reasonably robust way to exchange data, which is your point number three. So I think those are things that need to be investigated and then maybe redistributed to the group. So in fact, I would almost put add, two and three before one, because having this, I'm sorry, just thinking, having the sandbox and the um, distribution will then let, help us figure out what all the antibodies panels are, et cetera, so. I'm sorry, my apologies. No, no problem. So one thing I think uh, going back to Ron's point about normalization, we're going to have all these data sets to deposited by different people. How do we, we can use all that data to uh, look at these different uh, computational tools? How do we normalize those data sets? You mean in terms of like a comparison between the different technologies? Not comparison, the diff different technologies are going to give you essentially different quantification of markers. And they may not be, depending on the platform, the intensities might vary. Uh, some antibodies, uh, localization may vary, or we've seen this with like PDL1 antibodies, the number of different antibodies that stay in different regions of the cell. So, there has to be some way of, if we're going to use multiple data sets, some way of kind of normalizing between the data set for intensities. And there's some guidelines about where, uh, what to expect for localization of different markers. So I think, if I understand this correctly, once we have the ground truth annotation by the main expert, this will be kind of our uh, direct comparison. So what means we will not normalize it across the different technologies, but we will treat the different technologies uh, like separately, right? And then we will just see how well can we reproduce the ground truth. So if one technology potentially is not great in recovering a certain antibody or a certain mm -hmm issue type, we will just go with a different 
uh, technology for the station type. So this is at least my understanding for that. I don't think that we will try to normalize or like do a cross platform predictions or at least not yet. I think um, it, it, it may be possible for some antibodies, but what you're mentioning is pretty much what happens if there's something that wouldn't be the correct, like would be like a lower dynamic range in one technology versus another one, right? So we would obviously try to use the one that has the strongest signal and use this to define the ground truth. Unfortunately, Dennis, we Monica. see kinds of variations with the same technology on the same tissue, ostensibly treated the same way. It, it, that, that there is enough variation that that becomes an issue for some of the algorithms to handle. Um, and so we just have to keep that in mind that it that it's not going to necessarily fall out that easily. It's not even cross cross platform comparisons. And also for the ground truth, what would would you what would we use as the ground truth? I think what technology is this going to be based on? I guess this is something that is the question is: Do we use something like H and E, and use that? like a pathology annotation on that and use the consecutive slides. And then we just see what we can predict from the other modalities. I think there are other methods to do that by using potentially just normal immunofluorescence uh, to do that. But I, I, again, I, I'm, I wanna hear also like a discussion on that. Well, it goes to the question of whether you think material or subject experts looking carefully as a group or individually and then as a group at the same um, image come to an agreed upon answer. And that's the best answer we have right now. It's not true ground truth, but it's the best that we would have been able to generate without an, an automated algorithm giving us that answer. Then the question is, do the algorithms do better? And how do we figure that out? Or do we only care that they do at least as well? And I think that well, the history, of course, I mean, you know, this is now in the image recognition side. I mean, as I think everyone is well aware, the history, history of that with ImageNet was that it was trying to achieve human level performance and then it became superhuman with respect to inter individual disagreement. Um, the current, so the best available algorithms at the moment that have been tested or published are on H and E images. And um, there was just a paper actually out in JAMA that actually suggested that the performance of those image recognition algorithms, and as I recall, also some of the earlier ones on retinoic, di um, sorry, diabetic retinopathy were actually substantially exaggerated relative to human performance. So I think that human perform, you know, human annotation by an expert, by let's say a pathologist, is a reasonable silver standard for the moment. Um, Inter-individual agreement in the case of clinical caseloads is around 70%, but inter-individual agreement between pathologists looking at clinical trials and the clinical difference is thought to be much more time for each individual on each sample is, is around 85 to 90%. So, you know, that sets both a pretty good standard for humans, but also something that you could in principle aspire to improve improve on both with respect to speed and performance with the machine ultimately. Um, one interesting little thing is we have gone to quite a few of the commercial companies and said, why don't you call, use your best algorithm to call cell types, which is often immune versus tumor versus stroma in H and E, and we will look in highly multiplexed image on the same specimen to see what it is when we look at high, what many markers and they have all declined to do it because they actually, I think, are worried what about their accuracy. So I think actually it would be therefore interesting even in the public domain, which we're talking about now to take best of av available uh, image recognition on H&E and score that by an, uh, an independent molecular method. Actually, what uh, I see the better ground truth than just H&E. Uh, IHC could also be used, yeah. Yeah, so it just tends to be done less clinically, so there's been less analysis yeah. of it. So I also just wrote in the chat a little bit more. Um, I think that we haven't clearly defined, we, we never talked in the last hour about what is ground truth. And I think one of the things that we could look at is potentially something like 
as Peter said, immune cells versus like tumor cells versus stromal cells. And then we can use H&E, IHC to define those. I think if we really want to go into finer details, like what kind of immune cell and things like that, we also need to define whether we actually use one of, the, one of those highly multiplex technologies to also create those different ground truth. So if we have 10 minutes uh, left in the session, and I think it would be great if you if you have the Google Doc open, you can also directly uh, comment on that one. I think we will clean it up before before the session. I just wanted to know what else you think would be interesting to add um, as a potential collaboration besides things that we have discussed. And also maybe do you have ideas on what could be a good ground truth for such a challenge? So one thing is that HubMap typically works with healthy tissues, so no tumor tissues, no disease tissues, which is a little bit more, you know, harder because you cannot directly annotate, like there is nothing that obvious to annotate. Um, but I guess for this, if there will be a concerted effort, it might make sense to go for maybe a tumor sample rather, I, like, I don't know, but that's something to consider as well. So what you're saying is we could also like try to come up with good ground truth for the different for like healthy tissue, tumor tissue, other disease tissues. Yeah, that's a good point. But I like, I mean, I think Sinem's right. And in general, ground truth for healthy tissue is going to be much more accurate, right? I mean, I think what single cell sequencing shows is that it's not sufficient. So there's a lot more cell types than we thought, but you know, a well-organized tissue the fundamental cell types are going to be very accurately called by humans. I think cancer is just a, a big mess many times. So it's actually a much harder ground truth to establish. Um, so but if you went into, it depends a little bit what you're looking at. If you went into say a thymus and you were trying to get all the different immune cell types there, I think a human is challenged if there isn't a high dimensional picture. So we, we have done 40 to 80 plex uh, analyses of human liver, human thymus, and human lymph node. And um, the lymph node is obviously very variable, just as tonsils are very variable because there's, uh, you know, different immune responses going on. And the liver turns out not to be as normal in most people as you think it should be. Uh, we don't have all their drinking history. But um, yes, those tissues can be done. And the nice thing about them is that they are reasonably available uh, in bulk, if you want to call it bulk, um, to be able to get enough sections to share those, to do enough imaging, and to um, you know, have the kinds of comparisons among experts that we were talking about to get to the silver standard that, that Peter was mentioning. And the other thing that's nice about all of those is they all do contain overlapping populations, they're not identical populations of immune cells that share markers. So you're, you're crossing over with the probe set as opposed to making them completely unique to the tissue. So I think there are a couple of choices that can be uh, used for this purpose that, that we already know um, that there are what we would consider validated panels of in excess of 80 to 100 antibodies that could be used. HubMap is using heart tissue. I don't know what's special about heart, but that's the one they have selected. I, I was just gonna- It's a non-essential tissue, that's why. I was gonna second Ron's opinion also, I mean, we're immunologists, so we favor the lymph node, but it does give you, or thymus, but it does give you, you know, these uh, really densely packed cells for segmentation, it would be a challenge, but then you could overlay that and, and it would have value in other tissues. And if you can accurately call really complex immune cells in an immune organ, uh, then you can look at their relevance in tumors or other peripheral sites. So, and then of course the lymph node is relevant for biopsying. So, I would favor the lymph node for all those reasons. Thank you for 
for the feedback. I think we have about four minutes left. And so I open it up for the last uh, comments. Otherwise, before we close, I would really like to thank Sinem and Zoltan for writing a nine page protocol, which is awesome. So there's a lot of information in there that we managed. And also thank you that I could moderate this exciting session. I mean, we don't have to close it now, but if there's no other questions, I would just... Uh, and that's one more thing. We should circle back to something you mentioned at the beginning because we've been calling, discussing mostly antibody and individual cells. And we should include as part of the program or plan to go to, um, if you want to call them neighborhoods or doing spatial statistics, but understanding the relationship among any of the called cells in any of these uh, images as something important for the analytic part of this. Yeah, hopefully that is something that could be included in the sandbox as well. Yeah. I agree. I mean, ideally, ideally what we would have is something like uh, tissue that is connected to a certain clinical information and then people would just try to pull out what is the most predictive thing to uh, to this, to put them into different buckets, right? Like let the health and disease just in a very simple way. And then it would be interesting to see are those just the distribution of cell types or is it really the spatial distribution of cell types and, and, and tissue architecture that is predictive? So I think that also is a question, what kind of data can we put into the sandbox to really address this kind of question? So are there already like very specific spatial relationships that we know are like important in a clinical context because I think so far it's still really hard to get the right data set to really create those algorithms. Well, you know, I think you, you get those again out of normal tissue much better. I mean, the liver has, you know, all of its kupfer cells and these residents, the skin has and the gut, they all have these highly resonant local populations that, you know, we haven't shown that machines can even pull out the known features with great accuracy. I think everybody's been jumping up around about cancer, you know, immunology, which is just much more confusing. So I think showing that you can get the known architectures out of skins with, sorry, excuse me, tissues with either specialized or resident uh, immune populations is a great, great setting. And to some extent, the tonsil has some of those features. And we could annotate those features directly in the image. Yeah, that's a cool one. So we've actually already done that for the liver and for the lymph node. We have 3D spatial statistics showing that there's a difference in the density of regulatory cells near autoreactive T cells, for example. And in the liver, there's an asymmetry in the positioning of all the immune cells relative to the periportal region to central vein distribution in the lobule. They're not randomly distributed, but that was not that was done by expert curation and you know, sort of hand managed quantification. So that's an interesting thing to run through any algorithms and see if you get the same answers. So, so is sort of the ground truth on those already. Is data, uh, is this data available already published? It's, uh, it's under review. Okay, cool. Another point, maybe also talking about spatialists, we also can go of course high resolution, right? So then we could also think about cellular morphology as another feature, right? We also haven't talked about that as well. Yeah, actually like extracting those morphological features together with the imaging data would be super, I mean, we don't know what's going to come out of it, but I mean, there will sure be some associations, you know, pathologists can say, okay, this type of cells have larger nuclei and they, they know these details, but it would be great to have that systematically done in healthy tissues and disease tissues in general. And especially if we have a rich annotation, it would be really cool to see whether certain spatial features just are only present in certain annotated areas as well. 